one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers, but brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers? To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud, even your own brothers. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the Spirit of our God. You may be seated. Thank you, Adam. We'll continue in our se- our uh, sermon series on 1 Corinthians, and uh, you can turn to 1 Corinthians 6. But as you're doing that, I'll remind you of some things that happened way back in the Old Testament, second book of the Bible, the Exodus. That's the story of God taking the people of Israel who were in captivity in Egypt at the time, and that eventually they were in slavery. Uh, they went there to ride out a famine, but they ended up staying there and, and uh, ended up getting put into slavery. And they cried out to God in uh, Exodus chapter 2. We read in Exodus chapter 2 these words, during those days many... Uh, During those days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. And from that time, uh, early in the book of Exodus, God raised up a guy named Moses. You've probably heard of him before. He raised up Moses, and Uh, When he was an adult, God used Moses to bring signs and wonders to Pharaoh in the name of, hey, let my people go that they might worship me. Pharaoh wouldn't do it, so God brought plagues through Moses. God brought plagues, and then eventually, uh, when Pharaoh would not let the people go, God brought the Passover, the killing of all the firstborn sons in every household where the blood was not smeared on the doorposts and the lintel. And in that miserable situation, Pharaoh did agree to release the people, and Israel, the Israelites left Egypt, having plundered them, taken all of their, have received all their gold and things like that, precious metals. Uh, they left Egypt, and they arrived at the Red Sea. And, and um, at that point, that complaining, that crying out to God, uh, to get us out of here, get us out of this, uh, captivity. In Exodus 14, 1 to 18, we read that the people of Israel turned that groaning and complaining against Moses. Why? I, what was the, the, the quote? Uh, are there no graves in Egypt that you had to bring us out here into the wilderness to die? Folks, what we really want in this life is often put on display when we are under pressure. And in the church at Corinth that we're going to be studying about today, they were a people, just like you and I, you and I they were a people who uh, oftentimes got into conflict with one another. And pressure was applied. But in the church at Corinth, uh, for whatever reason, probably for a, a whole host of reasons, they had lost the ability to settle conflicts between themselves and had begun this practice of going and settling their disputes in the court. And Paul, seeing this, has something to say about it. So the big question we're going to wrestle with today is this. 
How do we maintain unity in the church when there is conflict? How do we maintain unity in the church when there is conflict? The church in Corinth was suffering. They were suffering the effects of sin in the congregation. There was, there was disputes. There was arguments. Everyone knew it. Word had reached Paul, but the people of the church were slow to do anything about it. Now, in order for a church to function and to function well, I think you all know this, but, but let me remind you, let me say this, there must be some level of discipline in the church. I mean, discipline is wrapped up in the word disciple. We're supposed to be making disciples of Jesus Christ. And that means that we have some sort of disciplines. And so I've, I've got three points to the message today on how we're going to maintain unity, even in the midst of conflict. And I've formulated them in terms of questions or in the, in the form of questions so that you can ask yourself these questions as we go through this part, part of a chapter. The question number one is this. Do you value unity enough to develop the skills to settle disputes in the church? Now, I've been in, I, I've been in church work for a, a while. And I can tell you, maybe this is news to you, maybe it's not. The number one remark that I get when I'm talking to people who are in the midst of conflict is this remark. I say, well, you know, maybe they're having a conflict with their brother or sister in Christ. I said, well, have you talked to them about this? And they say these words come out of their mouth almost every single time. You know, I really don't like confrontation. Well, what do you think we're doing here? If you're not going to talk to the person, then you're going to be really tempted to talk about the person in a way that could be construed as negative. And if that's not being done to build the other person up, well, then that's gossip. So we've got to be pretty careful here. Are you willing to develop the skill that when somebody in the church does something that rubs you the wrong way or that you interpret as sin or you interpret as being wrong a wrong against you are you willing to develop the skills to do that which god tells us to do matthew 18 if your brother sins against him go to the person don't go to the pastor don't go to the elders go to the person tell him your complaint if you can settle it right there it's all good you know if you don't if that doesn't work take two or three others if that doesn't work tell the church you know there's a whole process to go through here we ought to be able to show the world something completely different than the way the world operates. The world takes each other to court. The world settles their disputes using uh, that, that whole system. Are you willing to develop the skills? Now, first of all, let's just be honest with ourselves and remember, remind ourselves as we're approaching an election, right, that the government is really designed to restrain evil. I know that sometimes today it doesn't feel like the government is restraining evil. They may be promoting it, in some, and that's, that's not right. That's not good. But the government really, at its core, is designed to restrain evil. If you read Romans 13, that's what it says. And so, you know, I would, I would encourage you, as you're thinking about uh, who you're going to vote for come this November, uh, I think early voting has already started, so you could probably vote tomorrow if you wanted to. But as you think about who you're going to vote, you, you might want to ask yourself the question, which candidate for whatever office is going to do a better job of restraining what God calls evil? That's fair enough, right? But that's a pretty basic, that's a pretty basic uh, thing for the government to do. It's a pretty simple thing. for the gov It's not always simple, but what I'm saying is, is that it's kind of got a baseline to it, right? Now, let me ask you this question. When you, when you do something wrong or illegal and you appear in court or you haul your brother or sister into court, does, what are the chances that that judge knows you? Probably not good. Not, not all that great. Maybe they know of you if you live in a smaller community. But they probably don't know you. What are the, what are the chances they know your, your opponent? Probably the same, not good. If the judge knows one of you really good and the other one not so good, maybe that judge should recuse themselves. I don't know. But you get the point that I'm trying to make here is that the chances of them knowing you and knowing everything about you, what your life is like, what your struggles are, all that, probably not. 
But in the church, where we fellowship with one another, we are in life groups with one another, we know one another, we have a much better idea of what someone is like, what their sin tendencies tend to be and not tend to be, what their strengths and weaknesses are, I guess I would say it that way, and, and how we could best apply God's word in such a way to build that person up, challenge them to grow and change, become more like Christ. We would know if they're going through a crisis in that moment uh, for whatever reason and, and know where to apply grace and know where to say, no, we, you know, we don't need to apply grace because this is you're, you're starting to develop a habit. We want to help you uh, break free of this habit. You get the idea. We would have a lot more understanding. So the, while the government is designed to restrain is designed to restrain evil the church is designed to make disciples of jesus christ i mean that's part of our matthew 8 uh, 28 19 and 20 mission statement is we're designed to make disciples and that's a whole different thing and so paul here is is saying that you know even though this is our mission to go and make disciples of all nations you know of G make followers of jesus christ the church is falling short of maintaining any kind of discipline internally. That's what the church at Corinth is doing. It's failing to have discipline inter internally. We already talked about last week how there's this guy that's committing adultery and a very egregious a form of adultery. Nobody's saying anything about it. Now we've got a situation Paul's dealing with where the church is, t people are taking each other to court. Paul's like, this is not good. And he, he even calls them out. He says, look at verse 2. Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? There's going to come a time, right? And that's my kind of my third sub-point here. Making sound judgments will be needed in the future. There's going to come a time. This text tells us that we're going to that the church is going to sit in judgment of the world. The church is going to sit in judgment of angels. And so uh, we're going to need to practice sound judgment at that time. So why not practice? Why not work on that? Why not develop those skills today while we have this thing? Think about the church. You can think about the church in a couple of different ways. You can think about it as a gymnasium where we're doing bodybuilding, except instead of our muscles, right, it's the body of Christ, we're doing bodybuilding. Now listen, I bought a book about how to, like, build muscles in my physical body. You know how good that book does sitting on the shelf? How much good it does? Zero. It does zero. But I take that book and I open it, and I, I not only read it, but I, get, I begin to, like, leave and physically go to the gym and lift heavy things and breathe breathe really hard for like 30 minutes then things start to change right things start to get better the same thing applies in the church we can read god's word we can take it in we can understand god's word but if when the conflict happens we cut and run to the courts for relief we're not really disciplining ourselves to live out god's word you can also think about the church as a construction site, right? Where we get to practice construction. We're built, again, building up the body of Christ. And uh, you know, again, you don't read the plans, you know, the, 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 the architects and the, the engineers' plans, and then just lay them down and hope that the thing gets built. You actually have to do something. You have to take some action. So in places like 2 Peter 2, 4, we're reminded about this whole idea of judging the angels. God did not spare the angels. And then he, at the end it says, they're kept until judgment. And then Jude 6, Jude, there's only one chapter in Jude, so it's Jude verse 6. He says that, that there's these angels that are uh, going to be kept in gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Paul seems to be indicating in 1 Corinthians 6 that we're going to be part of that judgment process. And so why not hone our skills now? And then finally, I just uh, as a final sub-point, just... A reminder that wisdom and competence are required. Wisdom and competence are required. I'm not going to read it this morning, but if you turn to Proverbs chapter 2 this afternoon and read that, it, talk, it extols the virtues of wisdom. What is wisdom but living skillfully in this life? Living skillfully. In 1 Kings 3, 16 to 28, we, we read that wonderful story about King Solomon and how these two women came to him 
one of their children had died, and both of them are now laying claim to the children that's left, the child that's left. And we see how King Solomon applied wisdom and understanding to figure out whose child this really is and award that child to the proper woman. We need to be growing in wisdom and confidence. Now let me ask you this before we leave this point. I would say point one is very important. If, if a, a dispute between two people that you know in this church arose, could you take out your Bible and lead them and guide them to a solution, a biblical solution? Could you work with them and, and instruct them and, and walk them through and help them to reach an understanding? If not, why not? This Bible that we have is more than just something to memorize. It's something to live out. And Paul says he, that they are not competent. Secondly, do you value unity enough to be wronged to preserve it? Look at what verses 7 and 8 says. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Now on that, on that uh, point of this is already a defeat for you, Warren Wearsby is helpful. Warren Wearsby uh, gives three reasons why perhaps this was going on. First, he says the believers were presenting a poor testimony to the lost. There's conflict going on in the church, and how do they settle it? They go to the courts. Now, I just want to say this. Apparently, back in Paul's day, and in this city in particular, it was very popular. There was a whole industry that had grown up around taking each other to court. It was a very popular thing to do. There was eloquent speaking lawyers and attorneys that could, you know, they could wax eloquent on your behalf. And some of the times they people would bring all kinds of witnesses to settle even the most trivial matter. It was kind of a popular thing. It was, it, it was in vogue to sue. But realize that by doing that, Wearsby says that they were presenting a poor testimony to the unsaved. These believers are no different than unbelievers. Second, he says the congregation had failed to live up to its full position in Christ. Here, God has given them all this wisdom and all these things that are recorded in his word, and they're not even taking the time to become competent to apply them. They're instead going to the government to settle their disputes. And then the third, he called a tragedy. Warren Wearsby called it a tragedy. The members that were suing each other had already lost. I don't know if you guys follow any court cases or do anything like that, but here's a very typical situation, right? Someone does something to another person that causes some damages. Maybe they damage some property or whatever, and the property is worth $1,000. That's what it's going to take to replace the property exactly right back to its original condition. But because the, the other party not only got their property damaged, but they figure that they got their property damaged because of some sort of malice or ill intent by the other party, they don't ask for $1,000 in court, do they? What do they ask for? More or less? Oh, wow, you all answered that. More. And what, just throw out, uh, what are some of the possible reasons that they might ask for maybe $5,000? Why? What, what's that? Mental anguish, Mental anguish yes. Pain and suffering, yes. Anything else? Yeah, that's about right. So, so they'll go into court and they'll ask for $5,000 for an item that clearly costs $1,000 to replace because of mental anguish. And, and, and Paul is saying, you're wronging and you're defrauding your brothers even your own brothers, when you do this. Now listen. <clears throat> Paul's saying, why not instead choose to suffer? There are times when there is something going on between two brothers or sisters in Christ or whatever where the, the, the judgment is clear, one person is in the right and one person is in the wrong, 
it's very easy to figure that out. In those cases, I think the, the church can easily decide that. Church leadership can easily look at Scripture, right? But there's other times where it's not so clear. There's many times, many times I would say that I've seen where it's 50-50, 60-40, some combination of one person has got some blame in this deal and the other person has got some blame in this deal. In other words, you, you have a situation where two believers are in conflict and, and there were a lot of, I call them off-ramps. You know, you're cruising down the, the road of conflict and there was a lot of ways for one or the other person to take an off-ramp and either seek forgiveness or to patch things up or whatever and no, they just keep going down the road faster and faster and faster until there's a conflict, there's a crash. And in those cases where it's very difficult to figure out, you, you may know the facts of the case, but you can't really discern the thinking of the heart or the intentions of the heart, perhaps it would be good for one of you just to say, you know what, I'm going to give this to the Lord. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to do my best to preserve the unity of the body because the unity of the body is that important. Why not suffer? Suffering's not always bad. It it's doesn't feel good, but Paul in Romans 5 reminds us that uh, suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. He says, why not choose to be defrauded? Why not be, in order to preserve unity in the body, why not, in order to, to be a better testimony to the community, why not choose to be defrauded on a debatable thing? Remember, we serve a God who knows not only what happened, he knows the intentions of the heart of both parties. And so sometimes it's just more helpful to say, to not say, I will repay evil, but instead give it up to the Lord. Proverbs 20, 22 says, do not say, I will repay evil. Wait for the Lord, and he will deliver you. I think it's just, it's just good for us to be honest and call a debatable thing a debatable thing and choose unity over division. Now, why is unity so important? Well, it's important for testimony purposes, yes, and it's important, but realize that our effectiveness as a church is going to be seriously hindered if we're not if we're not unified that doesn't mean that we all have to like the same style of music or or that it doesn't mean we have to agree on everything but it does mean that we are going to stand lockstep together in the principles that are laid out in god's word amen that's it and god's word leaves room for us to have different uh, different opinions about things, different preferences on things. But God's Word has got some things in it that are just rock solid. So let's call a debatable thing a debatable thing and choose unity. But not only is, is unity important for our testimony and for our effectiveness as a church, it's important to you personally and me personally as well. If I ever had a Job-like thing happen in my life where like, my kids all pass away for weird circumstances, and my wife, uh, pass, oh, and Job, Job's wife never passed away, so my wife lived, okay, and I get sores, and I lose all my possessions, and all these kinds of things. What do I have left but the church to come along and support and love? And what if that happens to you? What do you have but your church family to come along and to love on you and support you and all these kinds of things? So unity is important for a whole host of different reasons. 2 Timothy 2, 4 says, remind them of, of these things, as Paul writing to Timothy the pastor, training the pastor, charge them before God not to quarrel about words which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. There are people that just love to argue the meanings of words, and you, you, you did this. Well, but did I? You know, technically, you could say that I didn't do that. I did this thing, got the thing over here, and that's not technically a sin, and so I'll leave it at that. Third, do you value unity enough to be humble? 
Now, my kids are getting older, and they are, three of them are out of the house. Ellie's a senior. She'll be out of the house soon. But still, for some reason, I do a lot of oil changes, uh, like a lot. And I've had to learn how to do oil changes on all different kinds of cars. Humility, you know, I don't know if what you know about internal combustion engines, but there's pistons and there's, you know, there's, there's cam shafts and there's connecting rods and all these kinds. And they're all moving around and there's explosions going on in there. There's lots of heat going on in there. But the thing that keeps all of that moving is the engine oil. It keeps things lubricated. It keeps things sliding around so that there's not, uh, that the heat doesn't build up and cause everything to lock up and stop. Humility, this is just me talking now, humility is kind of like the engine oil that keeps the church working. And Paul knows that. And so he wrote these words, verses 9 to 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral or idolaters or adulterers, nor the men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. <coughs> and he says, and such were some of you. But, and here's where he talks about God. God intervened, but God but you were washed. Washed from what? Your dirt? No, your sin. It was washed out of your life by Jesus Christ. You were sanctified. You were set apart. For what? For God's purposes, that you should walk in God's way according to God's word, empowered by God's Holy Spirit. You were justified. You were legally made right before God because of the full payment that was made on your behalf in Jesus Christ. Because of that, I, I have to believe that the whole reason that he, that he gave us these words at the end of this section is to remind us, hey, you were that way once, and now look at all the things that have been applied to your life that you didn't do. You have been made this way in Jesus Christ. You've been washed. You've been sanctified. You've been justified. Jesus did that. You didn't do that, so be humble. When you approach these things, don't immediately run to, you're wrong, I'm right, I'm taking you to court, and I'm going to extract my pound of flesh. Stop it. Paul wants them to remember where they came from, right? Remember where they came from. Romans 7, Romans 7, 21 and 24 is Paul... Uh, talking about just the reality of life that we live in. In, in Romans 7, 24, he, he tells this, he, he, he gives this argument. He says, look, in my mind, in my heart, I delight in the law of the Lord. I just find it really hard to live it out, right? So he says for verse 23, 22, I delight in the law of, the, of, the, of God in my inner being, but I see my members in my members and another law waging war against the law of my mind and make making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. And then he says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Paul is humbly stating, like, living in this life and trying to live according to God's word is not easy. It's not. Sometimes it feels like there's a battle waging on inside me. And then he wants us to remember what Jesus did for us in the, in the last verse of that section in Romans 7, he says this, but thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's, I'm a broken man, he's saying. I, I, I want to do the right thing. I find it difficult to do the right thing, but thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but in my flesh I serve the law of sin. He's aware of this battle that's going on in him. And then in 1 Timothy 1.15, he, he, this is how he talks about himself. The saying is trustworthy and deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. This is the heart attitude of who? Some guy? No, it's the, it's the Apostle Paul. 
His attitude, the Apostle Paul's attitude is not like, I'm the great apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. I can say and do no wrong. No, his, his, his heart attitude is, I am the worst. I am the chief. I am the foremost sinner. Is that your attitude about yourself? Do you see yourself in that light or something akin to it? A lot of problems, a lot of conflicts could be resolved easily in the church of Jesus Christ if every member just understood who they were when they were without Christ and what Christ has done for them and be humble. So, how can we maintain unity in the church in the midst of conflict? Well, here's how you can do it. You can do it by, number one, studying the scripture. But it's not just studying. You have to practice to help, you know, practice to apply things practically. So, practice to help settle disputes biblically by being open to being wrong, right? Especially as it relates to disputable things or debatable things. Unity should be unity of the body should be way more important than your ability at the end of the matter to say I was right and they were wrong. Unity is more important than that, especially as it pertains to debatable things. Then finally, cultivate by cultivating humility. By cultivating humility, and it is something that intentionally must be cultivated because I think our default setting is pride. By way of application, a few things to think about. Number one, if the Holy Spirit has given you some action to take, then do that first. Second of all, consider training and practice in biblical counseling to learn some skills that you need to learn. Listen, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, I don't maybe talk about this or toot this horn very often, but we're very blessed to have Pastor Jim Stevanis on our staff. Uh, he is one of the more gifted biblical counselors that I know, and he is on staff here at Delaware Bible Church and teaches these concepts right in the new multipurpose room Sunday after Sunday to help us become excellent at using God's Word to help resolve problems, try, try to help people with problems, you get the idea. So perhaps uh, consider that. Consider that getting that training. Third, uh, I would, and these are just very practical, make yourself a note to refresh yourself on 1 Corinthians 6 next time you find yourself in a dispute. I don't know about you, I write in my Bible, so I would go to the front flap where there's some white space in there, right? Uh, in a dispute, question mark, hyphen 1 Corinthians 6. Read that and um, remind yourself of these concepts next time, we, next time you're in a dispute with someone. And then finally, uh, read 1 Corinthians, this is like very concrete assignment, read 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 every day this week. I'm challenging you. Get a notepad, get a 3 by 5 card or a 4 by 6 card or whatever you need and write that passage on there and refresh yourself in it every day this week to be reminded of where you came from and what Jesus Christ has done for you. And again, if you don't hear anything else that I have said we have to be willing and develop the skill in all grace and gentleness to be able to go to one another when we have a problem with, with somebody and just talk to the person. 